Hello, this is a training for Efficiency Vermont's Lighting Power Density Tool. My name is Charlie Carpenter and I will walk you through the functionality of this tool. New construction projects in Vermont must meet the 2015 Commercial Energy Code. The Commercial Code has maximum allowed power levels for each room type. And this is calculated in watts per square foot for each space. Efficiency Vermont created a lighting power density tool that includes all relevant code requirements. This tool compares the actual installed wattage to the code max wattages. It compares occupancy and dimming controls to the code. It compares daylighting controls to the code if they're included. And it compares exterior lighting power to the code. Efficiency Vermont can only incentivize lighting that exceeds the energy code and this tool has an incentive calculator at the end of it that I will show you. The lighting power density tool is now required for all new construction projects looking for lighting incentives from Efficiency Vermont. This doesn't, uh, doesn't matter what the project size is and the lighting rebate forms no longer apply for new construction projects. The reason for this is we want to make sure that the full design of a building is efficient and not just the fixtures that are installed. Other benefits of this tool are that you can find spaces that are overpowered in the design phase and adjust them uh, to make sure that you can get them to be code compliant. And you can also show code compliance for a project by printing out the inputs and outputs of this tool and sending them to the public service department. Some basic information about completing this tool is that all yellow cells that you'll see are input cells where you need to put in information. Green cells are calculations or values that are pulled from the code. So you don't want to change any of the green cells. There's a link here on the tool that brings you to the Efficiency Vermont website. Click on that now. And that brings up our lighting power density tool page. And if you read this information and scroll down to the bottom, it, you have a request form that you can fill out and submit, and then you'll be able to download this tool for free. It's an Excel-based tool. Also on here, you can see what the latest revision was. Here is January 23rd, 2018, version 8E. And then you can go back to lighting power density tool and on this first tab you can see the version that you're in and we want to make sure that before you start this tool you're in the most recent version um, the biggest reason for that is that incentive levels are changed about twice a year so getting started with this tool we'll start on the first tab the project info tab and this is where you put in info for the project name your name, the date you've prepared it, and the applicable code, which is the 2015 energy code. The default mode should be this code controls and, com uh, and energy function. You can click on that if you need to. That's the default, and that's uh, what you need to do to get incentives for this tool. There's this additional efficiency package, C406. Um, leave that as no unless you know that this project uh, is required by the code to have an additional 10% uh, lighting power density reduction. Next, we'll go to the fixture schedule tab down here. And this is where you put in all the information about the lighting fixtures for this project. So first you start off by labeling the fixtures. I did this ahead of time. And then the next step is to select the lamp type. There are different lamp types. You've got LED, track lighting, T8s, T5s, screw base, and a bunch of other fixtures as well. I will note that track lighting fixtures are a bit tricky and they will require more inputs on the third tab at the bottom. So for now, I'll fill out some of these fixtures, A and B are LEDs, C is a T8, 
D and E are LEDs, and F and G are track lighting heads. Next, we go to the fixture specification column, and this is where you put in um, more detail about the information, whether it's a recessed downlight, um, you've got two by two and two by four fixtures, low bay, high bay fixtures, linear fixtures, and a whole gamut of outdoor fixtures as well. I will note that for exterior fixtures, you must select in the fixture specification the lumen output for the fixture. Uh, it's either 5,000, less than 5,000 lumens, 5,001 to 10,000 lumens, or greater than 10,000 lumens. And this is important because it will affect the incentive for the fixture. It's a little hard to read the lumen levels um, in here some, for some of the fixtures, but uh, those are the categories, less than 5,000, 5,000 to 10,000, and greater than 10,000. And these categories are what are listed on the DLC or Energy Star websites or the cut sheets. So it's, um, that also determines uh, the incentives for these fixtures. So I will go through here and choose a couple of these fixtures. So we've got a surface pendant downlight. We want a two by four recessed fixture, a T8 with two lamps, four feet long, 32, and normal ballast factor. And then we'll put a high bay fixture in here and a track lighting fixture. And for track lighting, you have three options, either a screw base lamp, a DLC fixture head, or an Energy Star fixture head. So we'll do a DLC and an Energy Star fixture head for track lighting. And for our exterior fixtures, they're both LEDs. We've got the outdoor pole area fixture above. And then I'll do an outdoor wall mounted fixture greater than 5,000 lumens and an outdoor floodlight less than 5,000 lumens. The next step is to come over here to the watts per fixture column and input the watts for each of these fixtures. And this is um, the wattage from the DLC or Energy Star websites directly, uh, not just the cut sheets. And the DLC website looks like this. And Energy Star website looks like this. Go to Light Fixtures, Product Finder, start here. And then you can plug in the fixture information. So now I will input some of the wattages that I know. 25 watts for A, 35 watts for B. The fluorescent fixtures calculate um, themselves because they know um, what wattage the lamps are and the ballast factor. For all the LEDs, you have to input the wattage. So for D, we've got 100 watt high bay. I'll skip E, F. We have a 30 watt track head. We also have a 30 watt track head for G. Down here, we've got a 75 watt pole, 35 watt wall mount, and 25 watt floodlight. Next, we see what the applicable rating category is for the LED fixtures, and this is based on the fixture specification that you selected earlier, and that needs to match the DLC or Energy Star categories exactly. So you see what the applicable categories are, Energy Star or DLC, and then you can come over here to the qualified column and select 
which ones are qualified and which ones aren't. So A and B are qualified. D is also DLC. I didn't do E. F is not DLC. G is. And we'll say two of these exterior fixtures are. You'll see in the next column, Energy Star fixtures purchased through a smart light distributor. That is applicable only for Energy Star fixtures. So all Energy Star fixtures purchased in Vermont are incentivized at the distributor level when you purchase them. Um, so those incentives are not included in this tool, but they will be estimated at the end. So you can see if that matches um, what you got when you purchased them. Lastly, we have a notes column here where you can put in any notes or model numbers on these fixtures uh, if you come back to the tool at a later time. So I mentioned that track lighting is a little difficult in this tool, or basically in the code, and that is because the code states that for any track lighting included in a project, you must use the maximum of either 30 watts per square foot of the track that you have installed or the, the wattage of that track head. And 30 watts per foot of track is really high, so that wattage always takes precedence over what the actual installed track heads are. And that results in a very overpowered space when you're doing this LPD calculation. And the only way to really get around that is to put in current limiters. And if that's the case, you put in the maximum wattage allowed by the current limiter, and you can put that in to this tool to adjust uh, the wattage that will be seen by those track fixtures. Also, for screw base lamps, the code says that you need to put in the maximum rated wattage of the screw base and not the wattage of the, of the lamp that you put in because you could later on down the road put in a less efficient, uh, less efficient bulb into that fixture. So if the, the screw base is rated to 75 or 100 watts, you need to put that in the watts per fixture here and not the watts of that lamp. And that is a code requirement, not an efficiency Vermont requirement. So that is it for the second tab. I'm now gonna move on to the third tab, the space by space tab. And this is where we will input each interior and exterior space um, individually. You cannot combine spaces here, put all your offices or bathrooms together because that will affect the calculation for the controls later on in this tool. You need to break up each space individually. The tool looks at the area and the space type to see what controls are required. So you start off by entering the room names, which I did earlier. We've got some offices, a conference room, warehouse, bathroom, classroom, retail, and manufacturing. Then you come over to this space type column and you've got some common space types listed, and then if you scroll down, some more building-specific space types. And the building-specific space types are for hospitals, manufacturing, um, warehouses, and the common space types are what you find in a lot of rooms, bathrooms, sales areas, corridors, um, offices, those sorts of things. So we'll start off here with our office. And if another yellow box pops up to the right, you need to do input a little more information on that space. I'll say this is an open office. So I'll click on the open office here. Do a couple more of these. We've got a private office. So you select office from the common space types. And it's private, so that's enclosed. We've got a conference room. And that is right here, conference meeting multipurpose. Nothing pops up there, so you don't need to do any more information. And we've got a warehouse, which is 
in building specific types. Warehouse storage area, we need more information in that yellow box. We'll say this is for medium to bulky palletized items. I will note that you'll have some rooms where you don't know what space type to apply and you just need to find one that makes the closest match to whatever that room type is. The next thing we'll do is add the area, the lighted area for each space. So I'll go through a couple here. Say we've got a thousand square foot open office, 500 square foot private office, 500 square foot conference room, and a 5,000 square foot warehouse. Then keep going to the right and we'll input the, the operating hours for these spaces. And you mostly just need to use the overall building hours for these spaces. They don't need to be super accurate and individual for each space unless you know one area, say electrical and mechanical rooms are only used a couple hours a week. So I'll start by going eight hours a day for the office, five days a week, calculates the annual hours. We'll do eight to five for the next office. Conference room is also, oops, made a mistake there. She tells you. Eight to five conference room. And the warehouse is 12 hours a day, five days a week. Next, you'll select the heating source for these rooms, whether it's an interior heated and cooled space, some warehouses and things are heated only, we've got freezer and some refrigerated spaces as well. So say the offices and conference rooms are interior and the warehouse is heated only, we need to select the fuel source. We'll say all these are on natural gas. The other options for fuel sources are propane, wood sources, and electric heat pumps, fuel oil, propane. Then we're going to start inputting the number of fixtures for each of these spaces. So this up here, these green cells are pulling information from the fixture schedule tab. You've got the name of your fixtures, A, B, C, D, E, F, and you've got the wattages listed below. So for this open office, we say we have five A fixtures and 10 C fixtures, and that's how you input it. In the private office, we also have five A fixtures, and we have five B fixtures. And in the conference room, we have two B fixtures and 10 F track heads. So as I mentioned earlier, with the track lighting, you need to put in the length of track. So when you input the number of heads, um, in this tab, it asks you per code, minimum of 30 watts per linear foot of track are required. How many linear feet of track are in this space? And in this conference room, we have 20 feet of track lighting. So you input that and hit OK. And then it's running a calculation to do the maximum of that 30 watts per foot compared to the actual fixture heads and the 30 watts per foot usually is always more and it's showing that here. So what this tool is calculating is you've got Vermont 2015 energy code, the baseline watts per square feet allowed. It's multiplying that by the area that you assigned and giving you the allowable watts for that space. It is then calculating Comparing that to the actual installed wattage here, giving you an LPD calculation, and the difference from your actual installed to the code is here, 
46%. And we didn't put anything in the warehouse, which has 20 D fixtures. So we'll do that. And again, I said the track lighting will reduce um, the savings quite a bit. It's actually saying that the conference room is 9% overpowered compared to code. Next, we need to keep scrolling to the right, and what we find are daylighting controls. So the 2015 Vermont Energy Code requires daylighting in some spaces that are under skylights or adjacent to windows if you've got more than 150 watts within those daylighting zones. And if you need to know how to calculate the daylighting zones, you can go to this extra tab down here at the bottom, Daylight Zone Diagrams, and it pulls up these diagrams from the code on how to calculate your daylighting zones um, based on the ceiling heights and the size of your skylights or windows or rooftop monitors. So going back to the Space High Space tab, you need to calculate the daylighting zones around your windows or skylights and enter that wattage here. We'll say this open office has 350 watts required to have daylighting controls. Then we'll say this space does have lighting controls. And then that brings up these yellow cells to input the type of daylighting control, whether it's ceiling or wall mounted or switch or fixture based. And in this room, we'll say we have five ceiling mounted daylight sensors. You can then select whether operational testing is included on these, um, yes or no. And it will automatically select all the fixtures in that space that are being controlled by the daylight and sensors. So it's saying five A's and 10 C's are being controlled. And if it's different than that, you'll need to modify it. Say there's only five of those being controlled. Then it will compare the wattage uh, right here. If you add up what's actually being controlled, it's 420 watts being controlled by the daylighting sensors. What's required is 350. So there are some energy savings here uh, that the tool will calculate. The daylighting controls can be a bit confusing. So if you have this on your project and you are confused, uh, please feel free to call Efficiency Vermont and we can help walk you through this portion of the tool in a little more detail. Next, we will scroll a little bit more to the right to look at our other controls, which are mostly occupancy, dimming, and time switch controls. The energy code requires occupancy sensors in a lot of spaces now, like offices, classrooms, meeting rooms, bathrooms, storage rooms, warehouses, and other small spaces less than 300 square feet. And where the occupancy controls are not required, then dimming controls are typically required. So these first columns here show, based on the space type you selected earlier, which controls are required. In the open office, you do not need occupancy controls, but you need time switch and light reduction controls. And in the private offices, you do need occupancy sensors, but not time switch or light reduction controls. There are savings in these green boxes associated with each type of sensor, and those need to remain unchanged unless we have metered data proving that you get more savings for, say, occupancy sensors. So I will start by adding some controls into the spaces I have. Um, we've, got, we've got some occupancy sensors. We've got ceiling or wall remote occupancy sensors, switch mounted occupancy sensors, or fixture mounted. And I'll say for our open office, we have five uh, ceiling mounted sensors. Down in the conference room, we have two of those. 
the private office, we've got five fixture mounted occupancy sensors. And you can go through it all. We've got maybe some dimming controls in the open office. And also in the warehouse. So we've got that and 20 fixture mounted occupancy sensors. Oops. So once you select the number of sensors in each space, it again defaults to all the fixtures in that space being controlled by those sensors. So if that's the case, you don't need to modify anything. If only a certain number of controls or uh, fixtures are being controlled, then you can modify the number of fixtures here. So we can check how well uh, these controls compare to the code based on these green, these, uh, these cells here. They'll be green if it exceeds the code, orange if it just meets the code, and it'll be red if uh, you do, do not have the number of controls that code requires. Efficiency Vermont can provide incentives only for controls that go above and beyond the code, um, which is not very many nowadays in these projects because so many controls are required. I also want to point out that in the upper left of this third tab, there are some buttons that you can click on that will bring you directly to certain sections of the tool, like this go to interior, brings us all the way back to the left to the spaces that we put in. We've got the daylighting, it'll jump us over to that section, and other controls, it will jump us over to that as well. Because now we're gonna go to the exterior fixtures. We're gonna input those and click on exterior, but the other way to find those is if you're at the very beginning of the tool, instead of scrolling to the right, scroll down until you find these exterior spaces. So for exterior spaces, you can combine all of your spaces of the same uh, space type together. So all of the parking lot areas, doorways, and walkways, or whatever you have on the project can be combined together and it won't affect the calculation. The next thing we want to do is come to this big yellow tab and select the zone type. There are four zone types and this determines how many watts are alloc allocated for each space type. And uh, to sum it up in a little, a little simpler, Vermont has no zone fours. Those are large metropolitan areas, uh, big cities. Zone three, uh, Vermont has some of those. That's mostly our, our large downtowns like Burlington, Rutland, maybe Middlebury and some other areas. Uh, not too many. There's a lot of zone two in Vermont, which is um, areas that have residential and some commercial mixed in. Um, so that's most of the projects that we see. And there's also a good amount in zone one, which are rural areas, national parks, um, some ski areas, you know, might be included in that. So I'm going to do zone two. There's also this next tab cell here that says is all of the site exterior lighting included in this tool so if you're only including some of the lighting in this tool on that site you'd say no but if this tool is including all the exterior lights you say yes and there's a little extra um, allowance either 500 600 or 750 watts additionally allowed for exterior lighting that will be split evenly between all the exterior spaces. So once we select the zone, then we can come here and input the exterior lighting area names. I did this earlier. We've got, I spelled it wrong, parking lot, some doorways and walkways. Then we come over to the yellow cells and select those space types. Again, we've got parking lots and drives, walkways, stairways, entryways, doorways, canopies, some facade lighting, 
ATMs and some other lesser used areas. So I'll do parking lots and drives. And we've got some doorways. You can either we'll say these are main entries and walkways less than 10 feet wide. And depending on the space type you select, you will either be entering the gross lighted area in a square footage calculation or linear footage. So for parking lots, it wants square feet. And I'll say we combine all the parking lots on this site. We have 20,000 square feet of parking. Doorways, if we added them all up, we have 40 linear feet of doors. And walkways that are less than 10 feet wide, we have 100 feet, 100 linear feet of walkways. Next, we keep going over and we want to input the operating hours for for these um, outdoor spaces. A photo cell is required by the energy code. So on average, uh, throughout the whole year, we will see 12 hours a day, seven days a week of lighting, and it calculates out um, about 4360. So I'll do that for the other spaces. And then we want to Keep scrolling over a bit and then input again the number of fixtures illuminating those areas. So in the parking lot, we have 10 A1 fixtures. In the doorway, for the doorways, we have eight A2 fixtures. And for the walkways, we've got two A3 fixtures. And you can see the yellow cells here for the extra base site allowance I talked about earlier. That's 600 watts being split evenly um, based on the area of those three spaces we have. And now you can see the energy code gives you the allowable wattage for each of these spaces. It's 0 0.06 watts per square foot parking lot, 20 watts per square foot per linear foot, sorry, of doorways, 0.7 watts per linear foot of walkways. And then it compares that to the actual installed wattage and then shows you how that space compares. We've got a 52% reduction on the parking lots, 73% reduction for doorways, and 45 for the walkways. And the colors here uh, will be green if it's more than 15% savings, orange if it's between 0 and 15, and it'll be red if it's actually overpowered. If you happen to have any motion sensing controls on your exterior lighting, you can keep scrolling over. Again, it says photo cells are required by the code. So say we had two motion sensors on our parking lot lights, we can enter those and it will default to having all 10 of those fixtures in the parking lot controlled by the motion sensors. And if that's different, you can modify it. So that does it for the space by space tab. I'm going to switch to a tool I completed earlier uh, to show you uh, the last tab. So the last tab is the summary tab down here, tab four. We'll click on that. So this summary tab shows the calculated lighting project savings. It estimates the incentives, and it can also be used to show code compliance. You can show code compliance, again, by printing off the inputs and outputs um, of this tool. So starting from the top, we've got some uh, calculated annual energy savings. We've got your interior exterior and control savings and those added up. We also have a summary table here of all the DLC fixture based incentives and the estimated energy star um, upstream savings going through the smart light program. We've got some other summary tables here that show 
what the total square footage is of your interior spaces and the savings. Same thing for the exterior spaces. We'll come back to that in a bit. We've got the control numbers and savings here. Scroll down more and we've got a detailed uh, table of all your interior spaces, area, operating hours, all the inputs that you did um, and the percent savings. And these colors here can be pretty useful to find out, uh, pinpoint what spaces are, are overpowered if you want to make adjustments to that before the project is complete. So if we scroll down to the bottom of this tool, you'll see the incentive, DLC incentive breakdown table. And what's important to note is that it says right here that incentives are only available for interior fixtures if the overall lighting design is at least 25% lower than the code. And where that number is located is up here. You've got the total interior space, in this case is 30% reduction from code. So that means that the full fixture incentives will be applied to all of the interior lighting fixtures. And this shows you how many of each uh, type of fixture we have. We've got eight two by fours, we've got 34 high bays. It's got the incentive associated for each of those and calculates your total interior incentive. Then if you come down to the exterior fixture type, uh, also an important note, it reads that incentives are only available for exterior fixtures if the overall lighting design is at least 50% lower than code, which sounds like a lot, but it's quite doable with uh, LED fixtures. And where that number is located is up here. Again, this cell, you've got exterior fixtures, right here are 60% reduction from code. So that also means that the full fixture incentives will now be available for all the DLC fixtures. We've got 10 outdoor uh, pole roadway areas, 5,000 to 10,000 lumens. We've got 10 of those at 175 a piece. We've also got eight wall mounted area fixtures greater than 5,000 at 175. Calculates it there and the full incentive that you would get by um, submitting this tool is down at the bottom here. I'll scroll back up here. And if there are any controls that actually do go above and beyond the code, on a custom basis, we can apply incentives for those. If they just meet the code, then we cannot give incentives for them. So that wraps up my training for the lighting power density tool. Um, once you complete this tool, you'll want to send it to your assigned energy consultant at Efficiency Vermont. And if you do not have one of those for your project yet, then send it to customer service and they will assign an energy consultant at Efficiency Vermont to look this tool over and get back to you. So if you have any questions along the way while you're filling this out, please feel free to uh, call Efficiency Vermont and uh, one of us can walk you through the process in a little bit more detail. Thanks.